Hey everybody, today we're going to study the prehistoric and ancient Mediterranean works of art and their civilizations. A couple of things to note before you move on to the actual lecture. Please get your textbook out and open to chapter 3.1. I don't want you to not read the chapter because the exam questions and the quiz questions come from the wording in the chapter. I'm not going to read you words straight from the textbook, so still keep reading that chapter. Make sure that um, you're well versed with all of the the vocabulary words and the concepts in the chapter because of course like I said that's where all the exam and quiz questions come from uh, during number two during this presentation I'm gonna ask a couple of questions so I'm gonna stop on a slide and say write this question down or answer this question in your own words and you are gonna have to turn in a page of uh, answers into D2L so you'll get more instructions along the way but don't skip those questions because they will be counted for a grade so uh, take a minute pause this presentation get your textbook and either like a piece of paper or another window with a word document open so that you can answer those questions and then when you're ready you can start again so at any time when you learn uh, or you talk about history with your friends or in another class any any time there should always always be an attempt to relate our contemporary world to the events and ideas at the time whether ideas are repeating themselves whether you think that we are more advanced or they in, in their uh, historical context were more advanced, etc. So as you study the works of art in this chapter, try and put yourselves in the shoes of both the artist and the viewer of that artwork. Remember that art is a visual language and some people communicate more efficiently through visuals than through speech, hence artists. <laughs> artists usually respond to the things that are happening around them. So wars, the economic state, the government state of their country, all of, all of their context helps define that work. So keep this in mind as you think about why works of art were made in the first place. And with this in mind, we're going to look at artwork created before words were recorded, as in there are no records of written language. What does this mean? <laughs> Uh, visual arts and image making instead is an important source of uh, historical record and we use it because some traditional songs and stories obviously have been lost over time. So we're going to use these works of art as clues to cultures and lifestyles of the ancient world. A great place to start studying these ancient achievements is the Mediterranean region. So look at the map on the screen, see if you can identify some modern day countries like Italy, France, um, Egypt, Turkey, etc. Um, but most importantly, notice the amount of coastline that you can see. Look at the Mediterranean Sea, look at all that coastline. Port cities along these bodies of water were an integral position for trade. So simply put, um, port cities held multitudinous opportunity for growth because of uh, their imports and exports. They were trading finished goods for uh, manufactured, well, manufactured, but completed goods. Uh, and things like that. Um, very successful, great source of economic growth. This is also one of the things that makes Houston or made Houston such a successful city because we are technically, or we were considered a, a port city. So like I said, um, that connection right there, the Houston thing, like I said, always keep your current context in mind when you learn about history. The most early works of art were recordings of prevalent things in their artist's life. Uh, procreation, which is the making of offspring, and sources of food, so hunting. You'll see a lot of hunting things, hunting um, stories. So uh, one of the first examples is El Castillo Cave. This is in modern day Spain. So look at the work of art here. What do you see? There are images of human hands, obviously. <laughs> and so the artists, um, how, the, how did they make this? The artists would make um, pigments by mixing natural elements and so I think this is some kind of iron oxide I think that's why it's red like rusty and they would mix it with liquid so they would probably use like a shell or like a husk of something and mix it together or maybe uh, they would dig a hole in the ground and mix it with liquid and they would use a straw like tool in the textbook it says reed uh, but some people could have used bamboo or something and they would uh, pick up the pigment with the straw place their hand on the wall and blow the pigment around and so that's how you get, get that ghosted figure uh, of a hand and clearly you can see here that the 
artists were right-handed because they were using their left hand on the wall and blowing the pigment around. And I, as an artist myself, love these cave drawings and cave paintings, especially the ones of hands. Um, I love to connect these early cave drawings to contemporary forms of graffiti. So as an example, another example of keeping your context in mind, um, I'm really inspired by street art and graffiti, and this is um, kind of how I would connect uh, these both historical and contemporary ideas together. So here I go. The earliest forms of art like these cave drawings uh, make me believe that human beings have continually desired to leave their mark, whether it's literally or figuratively, but they want to leave their mark in history. The act of spraying things onto a surface is definitely related to the tools used by graffiti artists, of course. But in a more deeper sense, the hands that are almost like the hands that I see in this picture are like tags. Like it's like the same thing as like a tag or a signature that a graffiti artist would use. These artists are similar because they've left a form of identity that marks either where they've been or where they lived. So I've always seen this type of work as the most basic reason that artists make things, which is to mark their context. Let's look at another uh, cave painting that is kind of about identity and location and see what we can interpret from it. So this, this cave painting that you see is um, in your textbook has been remade into a watercolor so that we can read it better. This is an ancient city in Turkey, modern day Turkey, and it has been studied by archeologists and historians. And what they believe is that the people in this place and this time lived in mud brick homes and that they entered through the roof. So they built, most likely, they built the roof line uh, of everyone's home basically at a very similar level so that people could walk across it and then enter through the roof down into their homes, kind of like burrowing. It's really cool. But in any case, the, their street and their sidewalk situation is very different than anything that we're used to today because we enter through the ground level and go up or away from yeah, from the entrance. Um, anyway, <laughs> in this drawing, the black blocks at the bottom are supposed to represent the homes. And if you notice, the white in the center of the blocks is supposed to act as a negative space. Remember this from your elements and principles of art and design from the beginning of the chapters, from the beginning. Um, the white is a uh, negative space, which could be Perhaps um, this is like the main family space. It could be the opening into the home. It could indicate maybe a tomb or a shrine or a fireplace type thing inside the home. It could just identify a home. That's what the white is there for. Um, and then at the very top of this drawing, you can see the that red organic form. Uh, that represents the volcano that's very near to their city. I think in your textbook it says it's like it's 10 miles away or something. That's very close by. But um, this is really cool. At the very, very top of this painting, you have some implied lines. And if you think about it, it's probably uh, an indicator of smoke. And then those dots and the little lines that are spewing out from the volcano are also implied lines. And they probably indicate falling ash or lava or rocks, things that happen during a volcanic eruption. So um, those implied lines tell us uh, more about their landscape and maybe more about the events that happened in the lifetime of these people in this city. All right, the last work of art from this particular section we're going to look at is a fresco made for a Minoan ruler whose palace and empire was on the island of Crete, and that is in Greece. Um, the work of art, by the way, is not pictured in this particular slide. It's in the next couple, but uh, just keep that in mind. <laughs> this is just a picture of the palace ruins. Um, this particular building, the palace, um, is believed by archaeologists to be a labyrinth of thousands of rooms and courtyards. And um, I don't know if you guys know this already, but a lot of us can recall Greek myths and creatures, and the myth of the Minotaur um, who is trapped in a labyrinth is directly related to the, both the construction and the artwork on this palace. Well, why though? Why? So it's, it's probable that the powerful ruler of Crete would have related or tried to embody the power and tenacity of the beastly Minotaur, um, which is a half bull, half man who eats human beings. 
and um, probably built his palace uh, as a maze on purpose. Why, though? Like, think about it. If you were a visitor, like a foreign visitor to this particular palace, imagine the psychological power that going through this maze would have on a foreign viewer and then finally meeting the king after that. That's just that's crazy. Probably did a number psychologically and physiologically to some of the viewers. Here is the fresco that we have been referencing. This was found in the palace and it, I mean, it's a dynamic work of art. It's fun to look at. There's obviously a relationship between animal and human and the animal here is a bull, which also basically relates to the Minotaur since it's a half bull, half man. And uh, if you're going to analyze this painting as um, we're going to practice through this entire semester, first just visually evaluate it. So for example, um, let's identify a principle first. The principle of design, which you learned in chapter one, is um, a really good one to focus on here is unity. Uh, and how is unity achieved? You would say that the colors are unifying because there's a very limited color palette. You have blues, oranges, browns, whites. Um, you can also say that form or shape is um, unifying because there are repetitive shapes all over. Same thing with texture, repetitive textures all over. Um, line quality, there's those dashed uh, lines uh, framing the action. But you could also, um, to include another principle of art here, you could also say that the opposite of unity, which is variety. Variety is also achieved, oops, sorry. Uh, variety is also achieved with the same thing. So those same colors, the blues, oranges, browns, whites, um, they're all spread out over the uh, entire fresco, which um, gives the eye something to look at at pretty much all places. Same with texture, same with form. Um, but I would also focus on the fact that it helps the viewer to understand the focus of this fresco, which is basically the center. Um, the use of color and form and shape um, is used really skillfully in the center parts of the fresco. The background is blue, so the, the artist here is creating like a background, um, an atmosphere of blue, on which they paint um, the brown and orange and white living figures, so the things with most motion, the things with most agency. And so that is how variety is achieved and also unity. Just a little practice there, a little example. So anyway, to bring it on back to our... <laughs> our lecture about ancient art. Let's see. Um, so why? How this is this is a another one of uh, a piece of ancient art that allows us today to understand I, uh, how ancient cultures identified in ancient civilization. So how? How though? Um, in this particular example, the bull motif in the king's palace denotes a connection to ancient Greek myth and creatures, so, so the Minotaur and the myth of the Minotaur. Um, the connection to rituals and athleticism or sport with the inclusion of animals is also here. You can tell that um, there's a very athletic figure jumping over the bull in the very center uh, and things of that nature. They're, they're dressed for athletics and stuff too. And then finally, um, I think that this fresco also kind of gives us a hint onto the Cretans um, cultural and social values too. So um, both genders are depicted in this painting. Uh, I think the two outside figures are females and they are um, denoted by, of course, their, their body shapes, but also their lighter skins. And so that's another um, a value, uh, another cultural value, or even a social value, I guess, of the Cretan culture is the fact that they depicted genders by different colors. So uh, just something to think about. All right, it is time to take a break and answer some questions based on this lecture. So get out a piece of paper or a work document and start typing the answers to these questions. Um, you don't have to title this document anything, just please number the responses. You also don't have to retype the question from this PowerPoint into your document, just type the answers. So uh, first question, number one, what is the definition of procreation? You can write it in complete sentences or in your own words, whatever helps you understand the definition of that. Number two, which works of art from this section that we just covered 
are about procreation. List their titles and media. Now, um, if you don't know, I didn't really go over any works of art and the idea of procreation in the lecture PowerPoint. So this means you're going to have to go back to your textbook in uh, chapter 1.3 in the section we just covered and kind of learn some more on your own. So like I said, the textbook is not dead. You still need it. <laughs> number three, how do these works of art that you just answered number two, how do these works of art depict the idea of procreation? Answer in two complete sentences minimum. So you're basically going to tell me the works of identif that you identified in number two above. You're going to tell me what the ideas are about procreation that are visible in those works of art. All right, so be sure to save your progress of this Word document or, of course, the piece of paper that you're writing it on because you are going to have to turn this in by the end of the week into D2, D2L for a grade, so keep that in mind. Now we're going to move east a little bit and talk about Mesopotamia, uh, which is now modern-day uh, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. And this is easter, eastward of the Mediterranean Sea, and it is technically landlocked, but um, the region was not necessarily successful because of its access to ports like the Mediterranean cities, but it does have those two rivers. And what that does for the land is first makes it super rich from the natural irrigation that happens with being between two rivers, but it also helped the um, culture flourish agriculturally. And the invention of irrigation systems from the rivers uh, and of course that rich soil again made this area really highly coveted among the ruling powers like the Babylonians and the Syrians, things like that. So it was the site of many, many battles. This work of art is called the Standard of Ur and the actual sculpture itself is called a standard, so don't get confused. <laughs> uh, this was made by the Sumerians. It is a small wooden box, but it's really intricately decorated with shell, lapis lazuli, and limestone. These are all inlaid into the wood. And the artifact is an example of art as a narrative. And so the stories and depictions on here are detailed enough so that historians have gathered a lot of knowledge about the ancient Sumerians. So to practice some analysis, let's see what we can identify. We already talked about what kind of work this is. Uh, it's a sculpture that contains inlaid shell, lapis lazuli, and limestone, which depicts the facets of human life in ancient Sumeria. Great summary. But in more detail, we can notice that uh, there are different narratives on each side of the standard. So if you need to pause and zoom in uh, to these or anything, feel free. So one of the, sh one of the sides shows life during si the times of peace. So this is the bottom, the bottom image. Uh, life during times of peace. In this, on this particular side, you can see different types of animals, people carrying grain, there's fish. These are all identified as well as different musical instruments like the lyre, which has strings on it. I don't know if you can see it. And uh, different types of clothing. All of these depict a type of banquet or a festival. And the fact that there's so much repetition um, and it's a time of peace, it means there's a time of plenty. There's lots of food, lots of resources. On the other side of the standard, which is the top, the top image, the ruler is immediately identifiable. He is on the top row, or what's called a register here. He's on the top register, and he's in the center. He is a larger figure in scale than any of the others, and they all face him. This is the principle of scale, remember, from the first parts of this textbook. Um, the principle of scale denotes hierarchy or importance. The figures on each side of this sculpture are dressed differently. So the time of peace, you can tell they're dressed differently than the time of war. And you can tell if you're looking at the war side by um, the armor and the helmets that some of the figures wear and some of the weapons that they carry. Chariots also are visible. War prisoners are visible. And it's all about um, the narrative or the story about the Sumerians' success in war and in their uh, rich and plentiful land and how they were skilled at harvesting and agriculture. If you are a Bible reader, then you might recognize the Assyrians. They were a powerful nation of battlers and rulers. They conquered many lands. 
in Mesopotamia and grew their empire. So now we're going to look at a relief sculpture, uh, which is a sculpture, by the way, that projects from the surface. So it's not necessarily 3D. You can kind of walk around this one, but it's just the word relief means that you don't view it at all angles. You just view it kind of 2D. Um, okay, so this sculpture here depicts a guardian or a lamasu with the head of a man, the body of a lion, which symbolizes strength, and the wings and eyes of an eagle, which sim symbolize knowledge. The powerful authoritative sculpture here was found in Ashurnasirpal II's Grand Palace, and it's yet another palace artwork. So keep that in mind because, hint, hint, you're going to have to relate it to King Minos's palace artwork that we saw previously. And uh, there's actually an inscription that goes along with this sculpture, which is awesome. It's great that archaeologists, archaeologists have um, provided this to us. Let me see if I can quote it. Let me look here. Oh, yes. Okay. It says, The beasts of the mountains and seas, which I had fashioned out of white limestone and alabaster, I had set up in the palace gates. I made the palace fittingly imposing. That's awesome. So clearly, this uh, is a palace work of art, and it is supposed to identify the power of the Assyrian leaders and, of course, their knowledge, the wings of the eagle and the eyes of an eagle. Um, so it really just uh, embodies their, their power and their status as a ruler. Here's also a connection that one of my previous, previous students made. Um, they were trying to compare King Minos's work of art with uh, Ashurnasirpal II's artwork here, this, the sculpture here, and they made a good point. They said both lions and eagles, which are depicted here, are kind of like considered territory animals. So while um, lions roam in packs and eagles may be more solitary, they're all about a certain territory, uh, as opposed to a bull, which is in King Minos's palace. Um, the image there is is more of a, I mean, it's a bovine. It's kind of an agricultural, tameable animal. Eagles and lions are not necessarily tameable. So that's kind of an interesting perspective on the different types of rulers and the different types of cultures and the different types of sim symbols, because most likely both the Cretans and the um, Assyrians were familiar with lions, eagles, and bulls all together, but different cultures and rulers decided to uh, take upon these symbols to identify their cultures. Maybe. Something fun. Eventually, the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians, and King Nebuchadnezzar II was put into power. He fortified the walls of his city with these dramatically intimidating gates. They were huge. And um, one of these is the Ishtar Gate, which is seen in this picture, was the main entrance and welcomed visitors and ceremony goers with golden animals sculpted within striking blue bricks. So imagine uh, in the time, during that time, these blue bricks were super vivid. And of course, gold is always a symbol of power and status. So it looked very rich. Imagine I mean, look how small that doorway is in the bottom. Imagine approaching a city uh, with these gates from eight different directions, and this is the main one. I mean, wow, um, how awe-inspiring and how intimidating as well to know that the Babylonian culture and civilization is so powerful as to have their gods sculpted in um, gold on these blue glazed bricks. It's beautiful. So this is yet another symbol of a ruler or a civilization's power uh, or authority. All right, let's take another break and add questions four and five to the document that you have been writing on. And don't forget, you're going to submit this in D2L at the end of this week. So question number four is, what symbols and meanings are similar in both Ashurnasirpal II's palace and King Minos' palace? Remember, King Minos is the Cretan uh, ruler from the previous section. So go back in your textbook and review if you need to. Uh, please answer question number four in four or more complete sentences, and be sure to identify which symbol you're writing about, uh, the meaning of that symbol, and which palace in which it was found. Don't be vague. 
uh, make sure that I can understand that you, that I know that you can that you're talking about um, King Minos or Asher Nasserpal, whatever. Just make please be specific. Number five, by looking through works of art, how are the ancient Mesopotamian and Mediterranean cultures different? How are they similar? So this one's going to be a bit more complex, but again, just like number four, you'll probably repeat a couple of things from number four in number five. That's okay. Uh, please just make sure to write in four or more complete sentences. Be very specific on which culture you're talking about. Organize your thoughts. So you should probably talk about the differences first and then like maybe do a space in between and then talk about the similarities. So please organize your thoughts. You can do it. Be, save, be sure to save your progress, too. Ooh, let's talk about everyone's favorite, ancient Egypt. The Egyptians focused on eternity and afterlife, and uh, preservation was used as the ultimate tool to create such longevity. So thanks, ancient Egypt. <laughs> uh, they believed that one must be prepared to prosper in the afterlife as much as on Earth. And so physical preservations of bodies, tools, and goods and sometimes even family members and servants were entombed with the deceased rulers. These complex funerary rituals were meant to protect the deceased person's life force, or ka. Uh, and it's interesting because that life force and our understanding of ancient Egyptian funerary rites is very much alive in our research today. And so, yeah, it's kind of ironic. Cool. Still lives on. Good job. You preserved them. If you don't recognize any of the works of art we talked about, hopefully you recognize these. <laughs> these are the pyramids at Giza. Uh, these are on the west side of the Nile River, so um, you can open up a map. It's actually pretty cool to look at them in satellite view. It's really cool. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, the, the pyramids are located in this type of funerary complex, and so the whole area has temples and statues and of course, the pyramids, tombs, different types of things that are associated with their funerary rituals. And um, they're really important, obviously, to the Egyptians. And along with their meticulous and very thorough process of mummification, they're uh, very connected to the cosmos or the things that are ha the things that happen in the sky, the things that happen in the atmosphere. So, um, for example, all three of these pyramids are oriented in the cardinal directions, north, east, south, and west. So think about what that means for uh, civilians in the Egyptian world. What does it mean that their emperor, or the emperors, excuse me, pharaohs get so much uh, recognition and so much care in their placement of their tombs? What does that mean for these intentionally placed, very precise things to be set in the cardinal directions? Just, just think about it. It's kind of fun. And secondly, um, the whole funerary complex is, like I said, located on the west side of the Nile River. So if you can imagine, civilization kind of, you know, built, grew upon the Nile River, which is north to south. And what is the most obvious thing that happens in the west everywhere in the world? The sunset right? So it's fitting that the pyramids are located on the west side of the river because they are funerary sculptures and um, basically buildings. And the sun sets in the west as well. So this is like signifies the end of life. So this is a very fitting place for the pyramids to be on the west side. And then inside the whole complex, the temples that partner each of the uh, pyramids are located on the east side. So they're, everything's still on the west side of the river, but the temples are on the east side of the pyramids. And that is on purpose, and it represents, um, you know, the most obvious thing that happens in the east in every part of the world, the sunrise. So as the te textbook says, the uh, temples on the east side of the pyramids signify the rebirth into afterlife, and then the pyramids symbolize the death or the honoring of death. You know, fun things to think about. Egyptians signified rulers and people of importance in relation to or the embodiment of their gods. So, for example, a sculpture for the resting place of King Khafre's spirit features the god Horus, who embraces the back of the pharaoh's head. You can see him behind his head there. 
um, Horus is the god of the sky and is portrayed as a falcon in this particular work. Think about which other cultures we've talked about and maybe even which rulers used the falcon or maybe a different bird of prey in conjunction with royalty or status. Think about what we've talked about before. Then think about why the sculptor, or in this chapter, is translated to he who keeps alive. Think about why the sculptor may have placed Horus behind the head of the deceased pharaoh. What does this mean for afterlife? What does this signify for the future of the deceased king? Another example of this is the portrait of Queen Tiye of Egypt. Uh, and remember that she was deified or made into a goddess by her son, Akhenaten. This uh, pharaoh enforced a centralized worship of a single god, which was not very common at the time because they had they celebrated polytheism. Um, Akhenaten wanted um, society to worship Aten, which is the disk of the sun. And since he deified his mother, the um, he obviously placed that disk of the sun in uh, in her headdress as part of her crown, and you can see it between those two horns and uh, just between those feathers. So she's embodying lots of features of um, the gods here. But the pharaohs and their queens' lives weren't the only ones that were preserved. Egyptian paintings act also as narratives, which we have seen before, to the lives and lifestyles of non-rulers as well. This particular painting uh, uses hieroglyphs and also depicts an important grain accountant, Nebamun. He is the centralmost and largest hierarchical figure, which means uh, this signifies his importance. His wife and daughter are also included, as they were perhaps depicted to accompany his spirit into the afterlife. The setting of this painting is on the River Nile, and uh, you can see that Nebumun and his family are placed on a boat surrounded by the lush reeds and the plentiful animals which he is hunting. And you can tell that he's hunting, um, look at his arm, his arm is holding the legs of those cranes, it looks like. And then the book also <laughs> tells us to look at that cat that's under his elbow that's biting the wing of a bird. Silly cats. Um, also, notice the way that Nebumun and his family are all depicted. Everyone's face and everyone's legs are in profile, which means we're looking at them from the side, but their torso and eyes are aimed at the viewer. This might give us um, a sense uh, that these, these figures are still living, as their eyes are staring at us, and it's like they're aware that you or we, the viewer, is looking at them. Also recall that uh, the Egyptians first preserved the heart of each of the deceased persons. They thought that the heart um, acted as the process for thought. So it might make sense why the heart, which is in the torso and the eyes, which were also preserved very quickly, um, are given more significance than perhaps the legs or the brain. we've come full circle and we are headed back to Greece. If you remember the Egyptians um, focus on preservation and calculation in their art and in their architecture, it's best to try and remember the Greeks as a civilization that focused on proportion and perfection, which is the ideal form. So Greeks equals ideal form. Visually, you'll be able to quickly identify Greek, sculpt Greek sculpture. So uh, for example, uh, the Greek sculptures compared to everybody else's in the ancient world <laughs> are very muscular in stature. There's very pre precise details. So um, to give you some context, Greece is basically a peninsula and it has mountains all over. And the city of Athens was quite the metropolis because you probably guessed it. It's on a peninsula. It's, a, it's very close to a port and so very successful. Each city-state or what is called a polis city-state uh, each city-state in Greece contained an Acropolis, which is a complex of temples, social buildings, and government buildings, and they were located on the highest elevation in each city. So it also served as a fortress. 
these were very sacred spots. So the across, um, most cities in Greece, especially um, the northern parts, are in valleys in between each mountain. So it's very important that the Acropolis was higher than the rest of the city so that it could act as a fortress and a type of perfection or, or sorry, protection or lookout. So let's take a closer look at Athens. Uh, warning, I'm going to nerd out on this one. So try <laughs> just take some notes, try and keep up. Some of this stuff is not in your textbook, but don't worry. Um, only the stuff in your textbook will be on your quizzes and exams. So just enjoy. <laughs> okay, so um, the city of Athens was dedicated to the goddess Athena and the Parthenon pictured here was the, the temple that was designed in her honor. Um, here's a few things to know. Number one, the Parthenon was designed with mathematical precision. Each of the columns is made of sections called drums, and each drum is stacked on top of one another like bricks. And that's right, the columns are not one giant piece. They're multiple pieces stacked on top of each other. And that means there's no mortar, there's no glue, nothing that holds them together, just gravity. This means that tech, well, okay, there's like, there's rumored to be like a, a shaft in the middle, like stringing a bead, like you would drop all the drums on each, on the strings. I don't know. We don't know yet. <laughs> this means that technical perfection though had to be achieved for this temple to stand up. Number two, the columns and the base of the Parthenon exhibit something called antisis, not emphasis, antisis. It's very hard to detect, but emphasis means that the designers of this temple made the base, like the center of the base, a little bit higher in the middle. And the best way I know to visually understand this is when you see an empty 18-wheeler driving along, the, the bed of the, the trailer is like kind of bowed up a little bit. It's like a little arch, a very slight arch. And they build them that way. They build them that way on purpose so that when you put a lot of weight on the truck, it flattens out. Because if you build it flat, then it would bow um, under. And then, of course, that's obviously not good for driving. So anyway, um, the middle of the floor of the Parthenon bows up a little bit slightly. Number three, all of the columns lead slightly inward toward the center. And this is also on purpose. It gives the tiny viewer the illusion that the temple is even taller than it actually is. So you can see people in this picture um, on the bottom left, and the, t the columns are leaning in slightly. So imagine standing at the base of them, looking upward. It's going to seem like the Parthenon like soars into the sky. It's going to look huge. It's kind of the same effect we get with skyscrapers now. <laughs> it's kind of sublime. Uh, and lastly, each column is fatter in the middle than on the top and the bottom. And they're also a little bit closer together near the center. So all of these calculated illusions, all of this mathematical pre precision, the fact that things are not gravitationally um, vertical, sorry, that they're not precisely vertical, means that every little bit has to be perfect or the entire building is um, thrown off and it could just wobble or crumble. But all of this is um, an, an illusion and it makes the building seem like it has a breath being held in its chest, or um, one student described it as its chest is puffed out, as in it's proud, it's strong, it's powerful, just like the house of a goddess of war and wisdom should appear. Greeks did not place their sacred buildings on the Acropolis in any particular cardinal direction like the ancient Egyptians did. Instead, they focused on the procession or the journey that each person made to, like up to and through the Acropolis. They also wanted visitors to walk around the entire temple before entering through the front facade because each temple displayed uh, narrative paintings and relief sculptures. And so a viewer was supposed to absorb the entire story and the history before entering to pay homage to the god or, to, or the goddess that lived in that temple. And this example relief embodies the Greek ideal of physical perfection. You can see, look at those chiseled athletic bodies. <laughs> Even the sinews and the joints in the centaur's legs are well articulated. So um, on my computer, this image looks a little bit washed out. So you might have a better time looking at it in your textbook, but the details on these bodies are just really, really um, well detailed and articulated, as I said. Um, the embodiment of physical, like muscular perfection is exhibited in this.
While we have very few clues of Greek classical paintings, we can still identify the success of this art form in their pottery. Greeks followed a precise and methodical process of constructing, painting, and firing or finishing um, either red figure or black figure painting on these pots. So um, if you don't know, a quick rundown of ceramics. Um, ceramics are made from clay, natural materials, um, mud and clay, things that come out of the ground, really moist stuff. And you're supposed to throw the pot, which means make its form, you build its form, and then you have to let that clay dry fully. It has to be completely dry. Then um, once it's dry, you can sand it down and make it more perfect if you need to, but then you can paint on it. And today we use something called glaze, but uh, back in the, uh, well, yeah, in Greek times, in this particular example, they just use something called slip to, to paint their paintings onto the pots. And the slip, which is just a mixture of clay and water, um, would turn black when it is fired. And so the term black figure paintings, we'll talk about it, uh, is the black represented on the pot. And the red, which kind of looks orangey here, is um, a red figure, figure painting. So the one, the pot that you see in front of you here is an example of black figure painting. It shows the figures or the people or the objects in black. The painter uses a mixture of clay and water, that slip that I mentioned, uh, and they paint the shapes of the bodies onto the vase or the vessel, and then they scratch away the lines and the finer details. This is an earlier form. In their efforts to become more precise, a red figure painting was discovered. So instead of painting um, the slip uh, painting the figures with slip, the artists would paint the backgrounds or the negative spaces, the outside spaces instead. And so they basically left most of the vessel red or this yellowish orange color. They left both mostly, mostly it was left to be red or raw. And they would then use a finer tool to construct details uh, into the red, the, the negative, sp the positive space. And this allowed artists to get um, more precise and more detailed and where they were able to embody the pursuit of perfection with the physical bodies uh, a little bit easier because I don't know if, if any of you are artists but it is a little bit easier to add than to subtract when you're painting. It's, it's easier to add paint onto something than to take it away. So here's it's just another example of the efficiency and the pursuit of perfection in this media. But um, again, my computer looks a little bit blurry or a little bit washed out. So if you have your textbook or if you have your computer in front of you, it's kind of fun to zoom in and look at all the details. It's really special stuff. We made it. Let's wrap up this chapter by looking at art from the powerful Roman Republic. You'll notice that Roman artwork is very close visually to Greek art. The Romans also desired to embody that same ideal form of perfection in their art and architecture, and their artists and craftsmen really forged ahead in those practices. Lots of innovation here. Uh, but there are some differences, however. Greek works of art were centered around Greek myths. The creatures and gods and goddesses that they worshipped were the main characters. But if you go to the next slide... The Romans were more focused on their leaders and on their ancestral roots so much so that they either put the face of a ruler onto a god or a goddess statue, um, like they would make the god or the goddess look like a Roman citizen or a, a ruler, or um, they might even elevate their rulers to the status of god, which we'll see with uh, Emperor Augustus later. But for example, this sculpture in particular does not emphasize the ideal athletic nude form that you see in the Greek statues. Instead, um, wisdom through age and ancestral rooting is celebrated. This particular Roman citizen standing there wears clothing that is appropriate to his status and, sh and social standing. And he also poses with the busts of his recognizable ancestors. And so viewers at this time would be easily uh, able to identify both the figure and the two um, family members that he is paying honor to. As the territory of Rome continued to grow into an empire, 
various emperors and rulers uh, who decided to elevate their powers and accomplishments started to influence the art and architecture as well. And one of those examples of prowess made during the, the Roman Empire is called the Pantheon. Now, remember that the Pantheon and the Parthenon are different things. And I remember it this way. The Pantheon is um, a dome. So like in the inside, you'll see it's round on the inside. Even if you see pictures of the outside, uh, not this angle, but others, um, it is round. <laughs> and I think of it as like the Pantheon has an upside down pan on top of it. That's how I remember it. Parthenon, I don't really use anything, but the Pantheon is round. <laughs> Just maybe remember it that way. Okay, so the Pantheon, as I was saying, is a, um, a temple that has a dome-like structure. And we'll look at pictures of the inside in the next slide. Right, this is the inside of the Pantheon. There's that upside down pan that I was talking about earlier. So the dome is 143 feet wide and 143 feet tall. And mathematically, it is so perfect that you could construct a 143 foot tall and wide sphere inside this building and it would completely line up with the dome on top and it would not roll around like it would it is that perfectly engineered and also something that is pretty special is that dome is made of concrete now if any of you guys are in, in construction or you know someone who's in construction concrete where it is actually work is actually pretty precise and we love it because it is used to build our highways and overpasses and stuff but um, it's really precise and it's basically liquid, you know, not liquid, but it's like putty. Concrete is, um, it's like mud and it takes a long time to dry. So the fact that these um, supposedly ancient, I guess if you want to call them that, um, these ancient peoples were able to construct this round dome that has lasted for thousands of years out of concrete is actually pretty darn amazing. So... If you wanted to study or learn more about that, you can ask me because I'm a big fat nerd and I love Greek and Roman architecture. But uh, yeah, so the dome that is made of concrete is a huge innovation. This means that the craftsmen in Rome were taking the things they learned from Greece and other places that they conquered and making it much more precise and basically more efficient and better. So, for example, the Greeks relied on marble and stone and wood to build their works or their architecture and their buildings. And uh, the Romans were able to do it faster because they um, had different materials and methods. More specific example of ruling power and assimilation in Rome is that of Emperor Constantine. This picture is not Constantine, but we know Constantine as the emperor who allowed various religions to be um, studied and practiced in ancient Rome, and that he was a very proud man. <laughs> and uh, some of the fun things that he did <laughs> was um, to show his power and achievements. He would go around Rome and quite literally deface statues of other rulers and other gods and goddesses, just existing statues. And he would commission artists to remake the statues with his face on them instead of whoever was in existence before him. So this is the attitude of the Roman Empire, <laughs> the Roman ruler. They wanted to elevate their, their status and make sure that everybody knew their accomplishments. I mean, and rightly so, I guess. The M Roman Empire was a very uh, long-lasting empire and a very large one at that. So this example, though, pictured here is... Marcus Aurelius and he is on a horse his face is very stoic he's controlling the muscular beast if you will and he looks as if he's very commanding he even maybe looks like he's about to give a speech or um, instruct someone or, or lead a group or something he's pointing off into the distance therefore he's focused on the future and statues like these ruler statues like these were often distributed to other towns just to also reinforce the fact that it was a Roman Empire and that the Roman Empire and its rulers were very powerful. And that's all, folks. This is the end of Chapter 3 um, of Ancient Architecture and Art in various countries and locations. 
For the last part of your assignment, though, I would like you to answer 6, 7, 8, and 9 here. Um, list two characteristics of ancient Egyptian, Greek, and Roman art. Please don't forget to number those responses. And then finally, I would like you to use complete sentences to uh, list at least three key points from this chapter. Do not copy and paste anything that you've written for any of the eight questions before number nine. Try your best. Use your own words. I want to make sure that you understand this. And when you're finished, save your document, of course, put your name on it and upload it to the Dropbox in D2L, which I will label for you guys. Make sure to turn this in by the end of the week. If you have any questions, please email me before Friday. OK, just try and email me before Friday. That will ensure that you get a more uh, swift response. And I don't want to wait until the last minute to email you back either. I want to make sure you get your questions answered. So um, hope you guys enjoyed this chapter. I did. Please let me know if you have any questions and good luck on your quiz.